think. Okay, guys. Thank you to everybody joining. I'm trying the green screen feature on TikTok. That way when people join, they can see what the topic is. Your daughter gave you a new Bible today. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, the other night we went over lesson one of Panorama of Prophecy Bible Study Series. That was called The Coronation of the King. Tonight's is called uh, Dream of the Ages or Dream Dream of the Empires, Daniel chapter 2. So this is Daniel chapter 2, and um, this is basically a study of when history, or, or sorry, when prophecy becomes history. So if you know anybody who needs this lesson, please share the live stream with them. It will be available to watch again on Instagram and Facebook, and then I will upload it to uh, YouTube probably in the morning. Um, and I just upgraded my internet connection today so hopefully we don't have the connection issues that we did on Tuesday night so uh, does anybody have any comments prayer requests or praises that they would like to share before we get started so any prayer requests or anything that you guys would like to share hi Harrison welcome for joining Welcome to everybody joining. Please share this with your friends. Please like, please interact so that we can get the algorithm to do its thing. Uh, because this is an extremely important study. It's very basic, but at the same time, it's very, very extremely important. All right, so if nobody has any prayer requests, we'll go ahead and pray. And if you do have a prayer request, feel free to put it in the chat at any time. Good evening. Yes, may the Holy Spirit be the teacher, definitely. All right, guys, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the study tonight. Uh, please show us where we are in history, how your word has accurately predicted the rise and fall of many nations and empires. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and may the Holy Spirit be the teacher. And may Christ and Him crucified be all that is seen. In your name, amen. Okay, so... How many of you have not read Daniel chapter 2? I know I'm probably talking to majority Christians, so I would like to ask a question. How many of you have not read Daniel chapter 2? Has anybody not read that chapter? If you haven't read that chapter, go to the book of Daniel and read it. It's very straightforward. And basically, what happened, to summarize, whether you've read the chapter or not, let's summarize it. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? He has just conquered Israel fairly recently at that time period. And um, he's trained Daniel and his friends to be part of his wise men group. His, uh, you know, they weren't the magicians and whatnot, but they were part of the wise men group. And then one evening, Nebuchadnezzar has this really weird dream. And when he wakes up, he doesn't remember it, right? It's very fuzzy. I'm sure that's happened to me many times. If I have a dream, you know, then I usually don't remember what it is. The details are very fuzzy when I wake up. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And so in um, this particular evening, he wakes up. He knows this dream is important. He's seen this magnificent thing, right? He doesn't remember what it is. But he, he, he knows there's something, he goes, he, this is not a normal dream, I have to know what this means, but I don't remember what it is. And so he says, call all the wise men, call all of my people, and tell them to come here. And so they come, and Nebuchadnezzar says, hey guys, I've had a dream, what does it mean? And they say, well, tell us what the dream is, and we'll tell you what it means. And of course, they were trying to buy time, because... They were a bunch of fakes and phonies because they, they, they knew they couldn't interpret the dreams. And Nebuchadnezzar was becoming wise to that fact, and he wanted to test them. It, you know, of course he couldn't remember what the dream was, but he also wanted to test them. And so he tells them, no, you need to not only give me the interpretation of the dream, but you need to give me the dream as well. And if you can't do that, then it's off with your heads, all of you. And then... As the story goes in Daniel chapter 2, they go to start executing all the different wise men, all the different magicians and soothsayers and everything, and they come to Daniel's house. 
And Daniel says, wait, 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 what's going on? <laughs> you know, before, let's not get too hasty here. Right? While Daniel trusted God, he didn't want to die. And so the situation was explained to Daniel. He says, take me to the king. Let me ask for time. We can take care of this. We can solve this problem. And so they take him to Nebuchadnezzar, and he asks for time. And Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, fine. You have whatever amount of time it was, maybe a day. So Daniel goes to his friends, and he says, all right, guys, we need to pray, and we need to pray right now. Right? See, Daniel and his friends believed in the power of prayer because after they prayed and Daniel fell asleep that night, God gave him the dream, and then he goes back to the king, and he says, All right, king, the Lord has given me a dream. He's awesome. He's worthy of all praise. You know, and, and here's, the, here's the explanation of that dream. So what was the dream? What did Nebuchadnezzar see in his dream? If you're watching on TikTok, you can see the green screen background right up here. That's an artist's rendition of what they think the, the statue may have looked like. Most likely, it was probably a representation of something that Nebuchadnezzar looked like. And Daniel goes through the scriptures and starts explaining what this dream meant. And he starts by telling Nebuchadnezzar, he says, There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Because think about it this way. Nebuchadnezzar conquered his area in a fairly rapid time frame it was an extremely prosperous kingdom an extremely beautiful kingdom there's a reason that babylon is represented by the head of gold right gold is one of the most precious metals regarding jewelry it probably is the most precious metal and babylon was not was a golden kingdom and it was known as that for a for a reason and so nebuchadnezzar is probably lying on his bed and he's thinking, man, I wish my kingdom would last forever, but what if it doesn't? What's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen to my kingdom when I'm gone? And so Nebuchadnezzar's thinking about all these things, and then he falls asleep, and he has this dream. And so Daniel tells him that the reason for that dream is he's saying, look, Nebuchadnezzar, God wants to reveal to you what's going to happen to your kingdom. You, you want to know what's going to happen to Babylon. God wants to show you what's going to happen to Babylon. So in this dream there was this statue of various different metals. You had, as you can see in the green screen here, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and uh, see if I can move to the side a little bit, the feet of iron and clay. Now, after the incident of, you know, the king ordering them to be uh, slain and Daniel coming along and uh, saying, no, wait, wait, I serve a God who can handle this. The, the impression that must have made on Nebuchadnezzar must have been incredible. You know, you see, one of the reasons that God did this, I believe, is because the whole purpose for the nation of ancient Israel was to share the gospel with the world, right? Um, but Israel and Judah, neither one of those nations were doing their job. They were, neither one of them were doing what God had called them to do in sharing the gospel. And so God allows them to be taken captive because both nations had gone back and forth between apostasy and uh, loyalty to God. And finally, the northern kingdom had gone so far in apostasy that, that God scattered them among the nations and you can't even find those tribes anymore, even to this day. And Judah had had the same thing and um, God allowed them to be taken captive by, uh, by Babylon. The northern kingdom was taken captive by Assyria. Uh, Judah was taken captive by Babylon. And so, but one of, the, one of the things that happened as a result of that was those faithful Jews, those faithful Israelites that were taken captive shared their faith where they went. I mean, Daniel did that faithfully so to, to the point that, you know, a few chapters later in Daniel, he was thrown into the lion's den for his faithfulness to God. Now, when Daniel received the dream from God and he went to go tell Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar says, can you give me the interpretation? And Daniel says, no, I can't, but God can. 
He says that there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Now, there were two main objects in this dream. And if we have time, we'll study a little bit of Daniel 7 and 8 as well. Hey, Andrew, welcome. Um, and well, Because Daniel 2, 7, and 8 are parallel prophecies. They cover the same exact topics with different details, with different symbols, and additional details. But in Daniel 2, it's very basic. There's a statue, and there's a stone. Um, now, the statue, as we talked about, was made up of different metals, uh, four different metals, as well as clay. Gold, silver, brass, iron, and then iron and clay. And then Neb uh, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you watched this statue, and then you watched as this stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, and it was hurled toward the statue, and the statue was ground to powder, and this stone filled the whole earth and became a mountain, right? Now, in a mountain in Bible prophecy, as evidenced in Daniel and Revelation, a mountain represents a kingdom. So this, this stone that fills the whole earth and becomes a mountain is a kingdom that will supersede and conquer all other nations in the world and become a worldwide empire. Now, we'll talk a little bit about what that means a little bit later in the study, but for now, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you are this head of gold. So, that must have been kind of flattering to Nebuchadnezzar because, you know, it, he was a very prideful man. He was a very prideful king in the beginning of his, of his uh, royal career. I, I'm not sure what phrase I'm looking for, but basically in the beginning of his tenure as king. Um, but Daniel answers perhaps what was an unspoken question for Nebuchadnezzar. What's going to happen after Babylon? Who's going to come and take over Babylon? And Daniel says, but after you shall arise another kingdom, but inferior to yours. Now, one of the things that this particular study brings out, for those wondering, we're going over Panorama of Prophecy, Lesson 2. This is called Dream of the Empires. I'll show it to Facebook as well. We're on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram tonight. But the major metal of Medo-Persia was silver. History shows us that Babylon was there for a while, but then Medo-Persia came and conquered Babylon. The main metal of Babylon was gold. The main metal of Medo-Persia was silver. That was their taxes. That was their finances. Babylon ruled the known world back then from 612 to 539 BC. Medo-Persia ruled from 539 to 331 BC, so the reigns of these empires are getting a little bit longer with each one, and their, silver, their, their metals are getting less valuable but stronger. You see, while gold is very valuable, it's a very weak metal, at least by itself. And then Daniel goes on to describe, he says the next kingdom after that is brass. So Babylon is the head of gold. Medo-Persia is the chest and arms of silver. And then we have another empire after that. But real quick, before we get to that one, what's interesting about the chest and arms of silver is that Medo-Persia was a joint empire. It was made up by two different empires, kind of like a merger or, or a, you know, a partnership, if you will. Well, and the statue had two arms, and this joint venture of empires was made up of two empires. See, the Bible is always very specific, right? Because God doesn't want to leave us in doubt. He wants to give us all the evidence needful for us to place our faith in His Word, right? Now, even Medo-Persia, though, they would not last forever. And one thing that's fascinating about Medo-Persia is the Bible actually name, uh, uh, specifies King Cyrus by name in the book of Isaiah as the one who would come and conquer Babylon. Now, history shows us that this kingdom of brass, this belly and thighs of brass right here, I've got the green screen going on TikTok if you, if, for those watching on the other channels uh, of the this, this statue here. Um, history shows us that Greece came and conquered Medo-Persia. And they are symbolized by the belly and thighs of brass. Again, it's a less valuable metal, but a stronger one. They ruled from 331 BC to about 168 BC. 
Now the Greek soldiers, the lesson says, where they were called brazen coated because their armor was bronze. You see, again, here the Bible is showing us very specific details that, that help us to place our faith in God's word. So, um, but as history shows us, Greece would also not last forever. The fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. Now, history shows us that the next kingdom that came and conquered Greece was the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire is symbolized by the legs of iron. Iron being a far less valuable than gold and silver, but also far stronger. They were known as an iron empire, and they ruled with an absolute iron fist. Now, they ruled from about 168 B.C., until the late 400s AD. It's kind of debated when Rome kind of ended because Rome really wasn't conquered by another nation. They were kind of crumbled from within and the barbarian tribes of Western Europe kind of carved out their own segments. Now, the Bible says in Daniel 2 that this kingdom would be divided. So the Roman Empire, the Bible even says the Roman Empire would be divided. It wouldn't be conquered by any one particular nation or by any one particular empire. But the Roman Empire would be divided into smaller nations that would eventually become modern Europe, particularly Western Europe. So you had ten tribes that, that kind of divvied up Rome amongst themselves. They were the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths. The Franks, the Vandals, the Alemannians, the Suevis, and the Anglo-Saxons, the Heralds, the Lombards, and the Burgundians. Now, seven of those tribes became the modern nations of Western Europe. Three of them were conquered by the little horn power of Daniel 7, and uh, they no longer exist, right? But some of these nations, for example, the Anglo-Saxons became England, the Franks became the French, Alemannians became the Germans, the Lombards became the Italians. Uh, one of these, I can't remember exactly which one, one of them was Portugal, one of them was Spain. So the Bible here is giving us amazing accuracy and amazing detail that shows us that what the Bible is saying here in Daniel chapter 2 is the truth. Now what's fascinating about this part, now we've talked about the head, the chest and arms, the belly and thighs, the legs, now we're talking about the feet, right? Because the feet, how many toes do we have typically? Ideally, it's ten toes, right? Now, the feet and the toes are made of iron and clay. And the Bible says iron and clay do not mix. They do not adhere to one another. It's the same concept as olive oil and water. They just don't mix, right? You can put them together, they'll separate. Um, and what history shows us regarding Western Europe is that the different royal families of these different nations, they intermarried right? Um, someone said, uh, Cindy says, I've heard Pastor Bachelor the clay is a cement. Yeah, he may be, he's probably right. Um, and so these different royal families, they intermarried to each other to try and unite Europe to be an empire again, and it never stuck very long. It never worked out. They separated, right? In fact, I believe uh, some of these royal families are even still related, right? Um, and so You've had these different uh, attempts at reuniting Europe to be another empire, just as the Romans had it, just as the Greeks had it, and you've, you had Napoleon try it, you had Hitler, Mussolini, Charlemagne, others. These different ruling powers, these different kings, these different political figures, they tried to reunite Europe to be of uh, a, an empire. Stephen Lopez says uh, the Roman Empire fell because of the immorality of, of their society. That's exactly right. That was one of the biggest contributions to them falling as a society. Absolutely. And uh, Romans 1, he, he quotes Romans 1, and that's correct. You know, Romans, sorry, Revelation 13 tells us that there will be one final attempt to unite not just Europe, but also the world in one empire. Okay? But Daniel 2 shows us it's not going to succeed. In fact, there was, um, 
there's a ministry called Anchor Point Films. They did a documentary on Daniel chapter 2. I can't remember exactly what the, Daniel, what the documentary is called, but go to Anchor Point Films, look up their website, and look for their documentary on Daniel 2. And one of the stories that they tell in that documentary is that, uh, I believe it was in the German army, there was a conversation that happened between some of the officials, some of the officers, and one of them asked, do you think Hitler is going to succeed in reuniting Europe as an empire? And somebody else pointed out, Daniel too, says, no, he won't succeed. And sure enough, Hitler lost the war. He lost World War II. I mean, he died in infamy. Um, as, as a, you know, he's not talked about in a good way ever since, right? But the Bible talks about at the, at the end of this statue, is there a seven-year tribulation we are going through? No, there is not a seven-year tribulation. Now, at the end of this historical time period that this statue represents, the Bible says that in the days of these kings, that is the days of the European kings, that's our time, folks, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That is what is symbolized by that rock that was cut out of the mountain without hands, hurled at the statue, ground it up to powder, and then filled the whole earth and became a mountain. As we talked about at the beginning of this study, that mountains, mountains in Bible prophecy symbolize kingdoms. The Roman empires were also evil and crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, now, according to Matthew 24, 25, and many other prophecies in the Bible, the next thing that will happen in history is the second coming. Right? Once this time of trouble happens that, that, that the world will be plunged into here soon, the next thing that happens is the second coming of Jesus. This stone that symbolizes God's kingdom that strikes the statue, the second coming will completely obliterate and destroy every nation on earth. In fact, 2 Thessalonians talks about how when Jesus returns, all the wicked will be destroyed. The righteous will be taken to heaven. There's nobody here during the millennium, except for Satan and his angels. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's response is truly, Your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this, this secret. Now, this ought to be a lesson to the faithfulness of God's people and and how that faithfulness will open the door for us to share the gospel, right? Because eventually, Daniel 4 shows us that Nebuchadnezzar accepted the gospel, and Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, will be in heaven. I believe he died a saved man. There is a great tribulation. The Bible says the time will be cut short, correct? Yes. Rachel says, I can't wait. I know. Um, now, I want to show you guys... This graphic on the end of the study, you guys can screenshot it if you want to, or what would be better is just go and Google search the Daniel 2 statue from Amazing Facts, or Amazing Discoveries also has graph, uh, graphics on this as well. This one I got from a website, it was like 10 bucks, um, so I can't, I can't share that one because I don't have the license to, but, or I can't give it out rather, but yeah, um, now, one of the, some of the fascinating details about Daniel chapter 2 uh, that Daniel 7 adds is um, how, for example, uh, Medo-Persia is, is symbolized by a bear in Daniel 7, kind of lopsided bear. Uh, it symbolizes, uh, Daniel 8 symbolizes Greece and Medo-Persia by different animals as well and actually names those kingdoms, right? Um, in, when Daniel 2 was written, Rome didn't exist, for example. Um, and then Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 were written, and God names the kingdoms that followed Greece and Rome and Medo-Persia. Because the issue is that um, so many people read these chapters. They read Daniel 7, and they say, Oh, Russia must be this animal, and Germany must be this animal, because their national animals are these. And so that must be what it means. W w w no, no. The Bible shows us what these different kingdoms mean. For example, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 7 and 8. Thank you for the badge, John. By the way, my middle name is John, so that's a good name. So Daniel 7 has the 
the beasts symbolizing these empires. Um, Babylon is symbolized in Daniel 7 as the lion with wings. Medo-Persia is symbolized by um, the bear that is lopsided, that has three ribs in its mouth. Greece is symbolized by the leopard with four wings and four heads. And Rome is symbolized by an, a, a beast that was so terrible looking that Daniel couldn't think of any likeness to compare it to, right? And then we have Daniel 8. By the time Daniel 8 was written, Babylon no longer existed. Medo-Persia had, had already conquered Babylon. So Babylon is not symbolized in Daniel 8 by anything, right? Look up the UN statue. Yeah, I think I've seen that one. I will look it up in a little bit. Um, but Daniel 8 talks about how Medo-Persia is symbolized by a ram with two horns. One of, the ram, one of the horns was higher and bigger than the other, symbolizing the same thing that Daniel 2 showed us, the two arms symbolizing the two halves of the joint empire. Daniel 7, the bear lopsided because Persia was a more powerful kingdom than, Medo, than, than Media was. And so Daniel 8 symbolizes that by the horns that are ones bigger and higher. And then um, that was the ram. And then, where is it, to uh, verse... Doo -doo -doo -doo. The male goat had a symbol, is what symbolizes Greece. It had one big horn, which broke off into four horns. See, um, in Daniel 2, Greece is symbolized by the belly and thighs of brass. In Daniel 7, by the leopard with four heads and four wings. And then Daniel 8 gives us additional detail. That big horn... Remember when Greece began conquering the known world, who was their emperor? Alexander the Great. He was young, he was powerful, he was ambitious. He conquered the known world within about 10 years, I think it was. And, um, but he died, he had no heir. And so, thank you for muting them already, you beat me to it. Thank you. Uh, Greece... Alexander died and his four generals took over and they split Greece up. Ex-Christian who are now atheists just fulfilling the word. Yeah, many will fall away from the faith. Yes. Thank you to my moderators who are catching the people who need to be muted. Alexander the Great was that big horn. And then uh, Rome in this chapter is symbolized by a little horn, which is very fascinating. So these different chapters cover these same topics from different angles with additional details. It's a principle called repeat and enlarge. So while these Daniel 2 is a very basic study, it's also very extremely important and very foundational. Very foundational study. Um, so again, this is Panorama of Prophecy, Lesson 2, Dream of the Empires. The th Stephen says the three ribs that was in the bear's mouth represent the three kingdoms that Medo-Persia conquered. That was Babylon, Egypt, and Lydia. Yes, that's true. That's a good point. By the way, um, I recommend that you go to the series. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. That you go to YouTube and search for Total Onslaught and look up Walter Weiss lectures on these topics. Absolutely incredible. Uh, way more detail than I'm, even I'm able to give you. Don't understand that part. Which part specifically, Maxie? Let's see if we can help you explain better. Do you believe the ten tribes of the barbarians are the same for Revelation 17? Let's look up that text and see. Revelation 10. No, sorry. Revelation 17. Verses 10 to 12. Seven kings, five are fallen. The other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. I'm going to say no, I don't believe those are the same group of kings, uh, simply because different numbers. School for Prophets, yes, absolutely. Look up School for Prophets on YouTube. I think he is most active on YouTube. He's on TikTok, but uh, he's not very active on TikTok. Uh, I'm aware that there's no seven-year tribulation that we go through. 
So the seven-year tribulation comes from, sorry, let me rephrase that. <clears throat> the seven-year prophecy comes from Daniel chapter 9. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. And let me answer another question real quick, and then I'll come back to yours, Maxie. Uh, Mr. Ron says, do I have any formal biblical training? I have a bachelor's in theology from Southwestern Adventist University, and I have a master's in Christian studies from Grand Canyon University in Arizona. So as far as college education, yes, I do. Um, now for the seven-year prophecy, that comes from Daniel chapter 9. Um, now Daniel chapter 9 talks about how the Messiah would be cut off at a certain time period. And it says, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, Ezekiel chapter, I believe it's 4 and Numbers 14, tell us that in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. Okay? Um, so, when it says for one week, what we're really looking at here is a seven-year time period. And it says, in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, a couple of verses before this, it says that the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. The word cut off means to be killed. And it repeats the same thing here when it says in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice to cease. Um, and so it says that he would be crucified in the middle of that week. So we've got to look at what this is talking about. So it says it's speaking specifically about the Messiah's death and it says that it would be happen in the middle of that seven year time period. Now in 27 AD, Jesus was baptized. This is what it says when it, when it says he would be anointed. Three and a half years into that seven-year time period, Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, or Calvary. And then three and a half years later, uh, the deacon Stephen was stoned. So that's what the seven years applies to. It doesn't apply to any particular tribulation, and it certainly does not apply to the end of times. So, I hope that helps. Let me know if it doesn't. Uh, if it doesn't, I can, I can always try and point you to other resources. I highly recommend Amazing Facts and Amazing Discoveries. And Secrets Unsealed is another good one. Those are probably my three favorites. I like It Is Written as well. That one is more geared towards new believers. I guess Amazing Facts is too, but the Amazing Facts is very prophecy-oriented. Okay. Any other comments, questions, anything like that? We're we've been going a little bit over a half hour, so we got a little bit more time. Uh, you can watch this later on Instagram, Facebook. I'll upload it to YouTube as well. By the way, guys, let me know if there's any um, glitchiness or choppiness in the live stream. Um, C.D. Brooks. I like C.D. Brooks. He was a very faithful preacher, in my opinion. I like C.D. Brooks, yes. One of my favorites is also Henry Wright. He's a good one. Um, I'm not sure. I think Henry Wright is retired now. To be real honest, I'm not sure if he's even still alive. But Henry Wright was, was very good. What is? I like Henry Wright a lot. Um, who else is there? Those are probably the one. Uh, Henry Ride's probably one I've listened to more of. I like his style. I like his passion. He's very good. C.D. Brooks is as well, like I said. E.E. Um, e. Cleveland was another good one. Let me go back to Revelation. Uh, do you believe the Ten Kings? Yes, there will be many false Christs that come. Yes, that's true. Charles Bradford, I have not heard him, so I don't, I don't know. If anybody can vouch for him, feel free. Ten kings are in Revelation. Okay, the ten horns are the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Yeah, that, I see what you're saying. That could be referring to Europe. I'll have to study that more closely to, to, before I can give you a more confident answer, but you might be right about that. Um... Two witnesses, yes. Okay, so that's from Revelation 11. 
uh, the two witnesses. Let's go there. I have posted videos on this topic before, so you can feel free to search my username along with French Revolution because Revelation 11 actually prophesied the French Revolution. Let me see if I can... There we go. So, Ivor Myers is very good, especially his content on the Sanctuary. I highly recommend Operation Blueprint by Ivor Myers. Yes, the two witnesses are the Old and New Testament. So, it says, just to kind of give a nutshell version of that explanation. This is referencing back to, I believe it's Zachariah, the, the olive trees. And it says that a beast will ascend out of the bottomless pit and make war against them and will overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which, notice this, spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So spiritually speaking, this is Sodom and Egypt. So what was the big thing of Sodom was sexual deviancy of every kind, right? It was one of the many reasons that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Egypt, when we study the story of the Exodus, Egypt was a very, or Pharaoh was a very atheistic individual. Who was the Lord? I don't know the Lord. I'm not going to obey God, was Pharaoh's whole mindset. And when we study uh, the, the end of the medieval time period, what we see is that France fulfills all of this, right? France became, they had an opportunity to accept the Protestant Reformation. They chose to reject it. And so they went, went complete the opposite direction. They declared themselves to be kind of an atheistic nation. There was sexual deviancy going on. And they actually made it illegal to possess and read the Bible for a period of three and a half years. That's why it says their dead bodies would lie in the streets for three days and a half. Um, and so after those three days and a half, the Bible was legal to possess again in France. So Revelation 13, uh, 11, rather, Revelation 11 prophesied the French Revolution. It prophesied how the Old and the New Testaments would be illegal to possess for a short period of time. Um, where are we going? Revelation 12. It depends on the part you're talking about. There's a, there's a few different things there. Uh, it prophesies the birth of Jesus and his return to heaven. That has happened. It prophesies a little bit of the medieval time period, the 1260-year prophecies. Um, that has been fulfilled. That ended in 1798. It talks about the rebellion of Satan in heaven. That's already passed. Um, but it talks about how the dragon is furious with God's people and go to make war with, his, with God's people. And that is still currently happening. Sweet and Sassy says, do you recommend GCU? No, I do not. Um, at that time period, I was not nearly um, as much in the Bible as I am now. I know that sounds ironic because I was studying a Bible degree, but it was, it's just the truth of who I was at the time. I don't recommend GCU because theologically they're not solid. Grand Canyon University in Arizona. I got an online master's degree from them. Um, they're expensive. Uh, that degree, I haven't, that degree hasn't done me any good. I haven't had gotten the opportunity to use it. Um, and like I said, theologically, they're just not accurate. So that's, that's why. Uh, if you're looking for a Christian university, um, look into Washita Hills Universe, uh, is it University, Washita Hills College in uh, Amity, Arkansas, Heartland College is somewhere in the east, I can't remember where, Wildwood in Georgia, um, Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism in California, uh, let's see, what's some other, Andrews. Andrews really depends. Andrews is really, really expensive. Um, so I wouldn't recommend Andrews unless there's just a degree that you can't get anywhere else. Um, I hate to say it, but a lot of our universities are just way too expensive. Southern 
Um, Southern has a decent program from what I've heard. I, I, I don't know. You're <laughs> Andrew says he's too expensive. Um, really, the best, the best program I can recommend confidently is Washita Hills College in Arkansas. It is an Adventist college. It is uh, self-supporting. Um, I, I very much recommend Washita Hills College. Um, it could open a Bible school. Well, if it's God's will, yeah. Washita Hills College is in a small town called Amity, Arkansas. A-M-I-T-Y. In central Arkansas. It's in Washita Forest, I think. It is, it is beautiful. I'm telling you what, it is so pretty out there. Da Vinci, how is it that the names of the Bible we have... It's not that they're white people names, it's that they're, they're English translations of what their names were. It's got nothing to do with race. Washita, yes, it is SDA. It is a self-supporting Seventh-day Adventist school. Do you, Cindy says, do you agree that Michael is another name or title for Jesus? Yes, I do. And I have posted about that before. I might repost that video because it has been a while. So stay tuned for it. I might post it again in the morning. Uh, TikTok, we got 60 viewers. Wow. I think that's the most I've ever had on TikTok. That's pretty cool, guys. Thank you for everything. Thank you for joining. Any other comments, questions, anything like that before we sign off for the night? Or prayer requests. Do you guys have any prayer requests? Prayer requests, praises, anything like that. If you have a silent prayer request, uh, please put, put silent in here. What website about the Sabbath? Sabbathtruth.com. That is an amazing facts website, and it is phenomenal. It is wonderful. So some pray for my aunt. She's very sick. You got it. Sabbathtruth.com. Amazing Facts has a few different websites like that. Sabbathtruth.com. Helltruth.com. Truthaboutdeath.com. I think they have one called... Let me look it up just to make sure so that I don't give you the wrong website. Uh, okay, come on, Internet. Work. Okay, they have, Amazing Facts has a website called papacywatch.com. That's another good one. Um, they have one called lngwhitetruth.com. That's a good one. Pray for my country, Trinidad and Tobago, please. You got it. My best friend, he was in Trinidad recently. He, he lives in Guyana. Moving to Kentucky. I've got a friend in Kentucky. His name is Jared Bowling. You should look him up. Jared Bowling. Um, pray that you find employment. Yes, yeah, Stephen, you got it. The Days of Noah on Prime Video. I started watching it. I haven't seen all of it. Um, I have it on... I bought it on YouTube. You can buy it on YouTube or Amazon Prime. Um, but that's done with Amazing Facts, Stephen Bourne, and a few others. Need a good doctor? Definitely. I'm trying to get insurance myself soon but we'll see how that goes all right guys anything else for those just joining we are we have finished up our study on daniel chapter 2 you can watch it on instagram facebook and it will be on my youtube channel probably tomorrow why do modern day christians try and predict the second coming of the lord um it is one of the ways that Satan can cast doubt on the message. You have some Christians who try to predict the what they believe is going to be a pre-trib or secret rapture. Um, you have others who try and predict when the second coming is going to happen, even though the Bible clearly tells us that no man knows the day or the hour of the second coming. But quite simply, it is because they are people that Satan can use to cast doubt on the message. There are people in the world who are looking for any and every excuse to reject the gospel. And people who predict 
the second coming, give them that opportunity to reject the gospel that they're looking for. And that That's simply it. Anything else, guys, before we sign off? I'm going to try and do a Sabbath afternoon live stream. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. I don't know if I'm going to have the time, but I'm going to try. Um, Andrew says, because of the falling away, yes. Yeah. Um, so you guys keep me in prayer this weekend. I'll be preaching at the Marshall Seventh-day Adventist Church, Marshall, Texas. Um, did the fallen angels have a chance to repent? When the, re when the rebellion first started, I believe they did have a chance. Now, no, they don't. No, they're way past opportunity to repent. Um, I appreciate you. I, yeah, likewise, Rachel. I appreciate you and all the other people who support this page and this ministry. I get a lot of hateful comments, and so people like you guys, um, I appreciate you. So yeah, the sermon title, the sermon is going to be the same one as I did last time called The Rock Strikes the Feet. Um, I have updated a little bit, so it'll be a little bit different than it was last time. But yeah, I'm going to try and live stream it probably to my Instagram page. So, and then of course I will upload it to my YouTube page after that. God bless you, Stephen says. Likewise. Yeah, the last one that I did uh, called The Rock Strikes the Feet is on my YouTube channel. Yes. Don't let them get you down. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 I I took a a little bit of a break recently just for that reason, but the Lord is strengthening me to get back into it. I appreciate your prayers. Just keep going. Keep praying for me. Um all right, guys. Anything else? Any other final prayer requests, praises, or questions? I'm going to sign off in just a few minutes because um, it's almost bedtime. <laughs> I do praise the Lord that in a couple of weeks I will be turning 40 years old. I will be turning 40 years old on October 5th. Ironically enough, that's the day after the Pope's next encyclical comes out. <laughs> when is my next live? I, I schedule my lives to go Tuesday and Thursday evenings at 7.45 Central Time, uh, or I call it Texas Time. Um, I'm going to try and start doing a Sabbath live stream sometimes, maybe not every week, but um, that way... I can do more of a uh, question and answer thing. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, all right, guys. I appreciate all of you joining. I appreciate your support and so many of you joining, especially on TikTok. Uh, let's pray, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the lesson tonight and the questions that everybody asked and for all the support. Um, thank you for the opportunity to teach your word and for everyone willing to listen. Lord, please forgive us for our sins. Wherever we are in the world, help us to have a good day or a good night's sleep. Be with all the different prayer requests for there was for employment, or probably for finances, for health, um, for doctors and all that. Be with us this evening, Lord. Grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit and the protection of your angels. And most importantly, your peace that passes all understanding. In your name, amen. All right, guys, I will see you next time.